Right, good evening everyone to tonight's Audit and uh, Governance Committee. Uh, item number one, apologies for absence, I think we're all here, so that one is good. Uh, item number two, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, Council Price chaired that one, uh, so I'll not take part in the vote, uh, but if somebody wants to move it and second it. Uh, move Councillor Dorr. Second. Councillor Clark. Council Clark, uh, vote please. If you're unanimous. Uh, item number three, declarations of interest. <coughs> nope. Uh, item number four uh, is the report from Azets, uh, who's going to be taking over the council's external auditors. Uh, I'd just like to pass over to their representatives down the end, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, just before we get into the report, I just thought it would be helpful to give a brief introduction to assets. And um, I know that we are one of the new entrants to the local government market alongside Bishop Fleming. Um, our firm is a top 10 accountancy firm and we've got over 3,000 employees across the UK. We also have quite a large public sector specialist team who've grown significantly in the last year in response to... Um, the PSIA contract win. So both myself and um, the engagement manager, Bethany, have worked in public sector audit for the last 10 years, both previously with Grant Thornton. Um, so understand the audit methodology that you'll have been used to and um, are happy to answer any other questions that you might have about our firm. Um, but following on from that, I'll jump into the planning report. So as in previous years, obviously the purpose of the audit plan is to set out the risks that we've identified based on our understanding of, of the local authority to date. And actually we, we have had really good engagement from the council. We've met with Becky and Joanne various mm. times and I met with Councillor Maycock earlier this week um, on Teams. And I've also met with Andrew Barrett to gain a good understanding of some of the risks that you're facing. Both myself and Beth are locally or located local to Tamworth Borough Council as well, so we have a good understanding of some of the challenges and some of the, the things going on in, in the region, which I think is particularly helpful from a value for money perspective, um, which we have already undertaken our planning work on, which is a great position to be in at this point. In terms of materiality, I appreciate that is as an appendix to the report, but we have determined our materiality based on the draft unaudited accounts for 22-23. So they may be subject to change, but at this point in time, it looks as though the materiality will be around that kind of 1.2 million figure. Um, but we will look to test to a level below that, which is around the 798,000 mark. Equally, any findings that we do identify that are above our trivial threshold we communicate to those charged with governance. In terms of our kind of initial understanding of the organisation, we've set out the key risks within the report and some of these will be very similar to those that you've seen previously. Um, the first one being management override of controls. Obviously we recognise that this is a presumed risk for all organisations and um, there is an element of management being to able to override controls that we see as high risk. So we will perform a number of tests to get comfortable with that. And the, um, that work will kick off actually as part of our planning and interim work. It's probably quite key to draw out here. Our ambition as new auditors coming in are really to get back to an audit timetable, which is in line with the 30th of September. So we are doing our planning work now, pre-Christmas. Our interim work is already scheduled in and agreed with the finance team. And our final accounts visit is also scheduled in and agreed with the finance team. And it will largely be taking place in July and August, well in advance of that September timeframe. The second significant risk, again prevalent to, to all entities, is that recognition or fraudulent revenue recognition 
but within public sector we recognise that that actually is probably more likely to be prevalent within expenditure. So we've looked at both expenditure and revenue and we are comfortable that there is quite limited incentive for management to manipulate those figures based on balanced reserve levels for a number of years, even though we recognise in the medium term financial plan there is a position at year three that we'll be looking into from a value for money perspective. But overall, we're, we're not concerned that that presents heightened risk to the council. The other two areas that are contained on page 10 and 11, these are where we draw out our key accounting estimates that are important to the council. Um, the first of that being the valuation of the pension asset or liability, wherever that may fall for the next year, and the other being the valuation of council dwellings, other land and buildings and investment properties. We've already got a good understanding of management over how that process works and there will be a full revaluation taking place at the year end. We're not planning to use an auditor's expert at this time because we don't feel it, that it's necessary, but should anything change through the process, we will reevaluate our risk assessment and, and take it forward from there. Following on from page 12, as I've mentioned, we have done our value for money risk assessment. We're also not aware of any significant weaknesses that current auditors may be highlighting in this area. And that's consistent with our planning work that, that we've completed today. And we don't consider that at this point there are any significant weaknesses that we require to bring to your attention. But we will obviously continue to do that work throughout the year up until the point that we, that we sign. On page 14, it, it does set out that timetable. And as I say, this is a really key thing for us. We will be agreeing with management and accounts and audit timetable. We recognise that we need to work in partnership to, to enable a successful sign off of the financial statements and we'll be undertaking an on-site audit visit um, in July, sorry, with partner review already booked in as well. On page 15, we have set out our non-audit services that the council has already engaged with us to provide as well. These are audit related services, but we will be doing the housing benefit grant claim and the pooling of capital receipts grant claim. So we are obligated to make, make you aware of that and also recognise that we don't consider that there are any threats to our independence to enable us to do that work and sign the audit opinion. The last page, as I've said, sets out materiality on the appendix in a bit more context around that. Um, but I don't have anything further to draw attention to, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions on the report or, or anything in terms of the whole audit process that, that you might have. Uh, cheers, thank you. And uh, thanks for taking the time to meet with us uh, before this evening, <coughs> the, the other day. Uh, has anybody got any questions, Councillor Dorr? Uh, just the one. Um, what's your experience of auditing, and have you uh, been involved with any other authorities that are currently experiencing any difficulties? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so my my career with the public sector or with public sector audit started in twenty twelve. So I worked in Grant Thornton's public sector audit team from then until I joined ASEX. My background has very much been specialising in local government and NHS, particularly those bodies that are challenged financially. And my last audit client with Grant Thornton was Birmingham City Council. But actually, I am used to working with district councils, METs, county councils, and I've got a wide range of experience. <clears throat> Equally, um, Beth has got a similar experience and joined from Grant Thornton within their team at a similar time to myself in 2019. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No. 
brilliant. Uh, thank you for that. Um, th there's no recommendation to endorse. Uh, ju just thank you for the time in, in preparing the, the plan and uh, coming to meet with us. Uh, item number five is the counter fraud updates, uh, and I'd like to pass over to the monitoring officer. I think. Oh, uh, Andrew, cheers. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to present, present my report to the committee on the work completed in respect to counter fraud for the period April to September 2023, together with the refresh counter fraud policies. I ask that the committee endorses this report together with the updated fraud action plan and fraud risk register. In addition, I request endorsement of the following policies, the counter fraud and corruption policy strategy, whistleblowing policy and the anti money laundering policy. In addition, I ask for delegation to make minor changes to the above policies in respect to job titles, contact details and such like within these policies. In summary, our work during the current financial year has included work on the data uploads and information received from the data matches by the Cabinet Office's National Fraud Initiative. And during the previous financial year, we did upload data on the required data sets outlined in my report. And during 2023-24, we have started those reviews of those data matches. A, ref a refresh of the data is required to be uploaded on both council tax single person discount and also the electoral register and this will be completed after the 30th of November 2023. Committee should note that the time frame for this is actually as soon as possible after the 30th of November and we are on target to meet this date. To make the committee aware we do carry out routine counter fraud work which includes reviews of NNDR council tax reduction, single person's discount, council house illegal subletting and also non-residents. This is supported also by proactive system checks and where appropriate home visits by the counter fraud officer. Due to our checks for the first six months of the financial year, we have identified proven cases totaling £19,157. And those are in respect of the council tax reduction and also the NFI single person discount checks. We also carry out proactive checks on, on 39 housing related applications. In line with good practice, my report includes an updated fraud action plan and also a fraud risk register. And these have been both refreshed and updated and include the work that will be carried out during the year and those are both included as Appendix 1 and 2 of my report. The Fraud Action Plan contains an outline of the fraud work that will be undertaken during this, this financial year and also the work that has already been completed. The Fraud Risk Register includes an outline of the fraud risks appertaining to the Council and also an assessment of both the risk and also the overall residual risk taking into account management control environment. Again, those have been refreshed for minor changes. The report also includes updates to the Council's counter-fraud policies, and those are included as Appendices 3, 4 and 5 of my report. And again, these have been refreshed for minor changes, and those have actually been highlighted as the Council Leader's signature, which has been updated, update to the name Section 151 Officer, and also updating of our external auditor contact details. Any changes to those, those policies have been highlighted in yellow in my report. Following endorsement of these policies, these will be recirculated to all staff for acknowledgement and compliance within the requirements within them, within them and this will be done via our e-learning platform, Astute. Um, I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have on my report. Cheers, Andrew. Uh, anybody got any questions? I suppose one with, with them, the figures of the nineteen thousand that, that you'd identified. What 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 goes on after that? Obviously, it'll be in the policy. But are we proactive in in pushing them fraud cases? Yeah. 
Yes, we'd be, we'd be actually reviewing those cases and also putting into place recovery action to ensure that, that those monies are returned to the, to the council and that, for example, like on the single person's discount, for example, where we've identified where single person discount isn't appropriate, then obviously adjustments to council tax accounts are, are made in relation to that for, for that recovery. So we do take proactive recovery action in relation to that, that money to re return that back to the council. Anybody else? No? Uh, thank you for that. And we'll just take the recommendations one through five. Uh, I'll move them and look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Dahl. All those in favour? Uh, unanimous. Uh, item number six is the risk management quarterly update, uh, quarter two. And i uh, hand over to the Assistant Director of Finance. Jess. Thank you. So this is the regular quarterly risk management update for the committee for quarter two of the 23-24 financial year. One of the functions of the Audit and Governance Committee is to monitor the effectiveness of the authority's strategic risk management arrangements. This report includes the actions taken to manage those risks and raises issues of concern that may impact the authority. Corporate risks are identified, managed and monitored by the corporate management team on a quarterly basis. The corporate risk register has been reviewed and current risk scores and notes have been updated by CMT for quarter two reporting. A copy of the current corporate risk register is attached as Appendix 1. There has been a positive change to the overall corporate risk profile since quarter 1, as shown in Appendix 2, Risk Matrix Summary. The Council's high to medium risk profile remains unchanged, but Risks 2, Governance and 4, Lack of Resources, Capacity and Right Skills in Place, have moved from medium to low risk to low risk. The Operational Risk Champions Group met during quarter two to gather information and monitor significant risks across their service areas. The Risk Champions are reviewing their department's operational risks and the current reporting process following workshops with Zurich Municipal. High inflation and the cost of living continues to feature as a high risk and there is also further concern around the impact of the Israel-Hamas conflict on financial markets and the economy. These risks will continue to be monitored. The committee is asked to endorse the corporate risk register. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Cheers, Joe. Uh, anybody? Any questions? I just think one bit of good news that's come out from this morning that inflation's actually gone below the five percent, and so so, so so that's that's quite a, a good thing in terms of the, the outlook for the council. Uh, so I'd like to move that the committee endorse the corporate risk register. I'll move that. Uh, look for a seconder. All those in favour? Cheers, Joe. Uh, item number seven is the revised councillors' code of conduct procedures. Uh, I'd like to hand over to the mon monitoring officer, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of the report this evening is to advise the committee of the right uh, arrangements for dealing with complaints in relation to councillors for an alleged breach of code of conduct. Members will recall a report from the Office for Standards in Public Life that made a number of recommendations in relation to the form and content of code of conduct for members' behaviour. And partially in response to that report, the LDA commissioned a new model code of conduct and the principles of this were reported to audit and governance in the back end of last year. An all-member workshop was held to discuss these differences and these can be found and summarised in Appendix 4 of the report. All local authorities are required to have a local code of conduct and they are to ensure that they are and continue to be fit for purpose. And following the report submitted to Audit and Governance in February of this year, where the new local code was endorsed, a review has been undertaken. Although the Council's co uh, present Code of Conduct could be considered fit for purpose, adoption of the LDA model code will bring about improvement and greater consistency and transparency. 
The current Code of Conduct procedure for dealing with complaints was implemented in 2014 and guidance is for policies to be reviewed on a regular basis to ensure they do remain fit for purpose. An update of the code and documentation is available in the report at Appendices 1 to 3 with a summary of the differences at Appendix 4 and it is asked of the committee this evening for members to recommend to Council the adoption of the revised Code of Conduct and the documents contained within. Um, and I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Uh, Chase, uh, anybody got any questions? I mean, I think it's a good thing. It's a, a lot more substantive than than the original. Uh, well, the code of conduct as it stands uh, now, um, especially getting the input from the LGI and and member input uh, from Appendix Four. Uh, Councillor Daniels. Thank you very much. It's really comprehensive. And again, this is my ignorance coming through here. Obviously, this is going to apply to members. Um, in terms of code of conduct for officers and staff, there is also, I'm assuming, a similar document as a working together as a full council. There is a code. Um, it hasn't been reviewed as part of this process, but there is a code of conduct for council, uh, for officers, yes. I understand there is, yeah. I, th I think I'll just add one more. Um, it, it, it's with the next item number eight as well, um, with the, the, the working draft for the constitution, obviously, and I, I know that this item hasn't been okay yet, but once that's okay, will that go into the working draft? Yes, once, it, if, um, once it's endorsed, it goes from here to full council. If it's endorsed at full council, then yes, it'll be um, put into the new constitution. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, move on block the recommendations one and uh, two. I'll move them. Second account. Uh, Clark, sorry. Uh, all those in favour? That was that everyone, sorry. Yeah, cheers. Uh, on to item number. Uh, constitution scheme of delegation update uh, again the report of the monitoring officer Cheers. thank you chair um, okay so the purpose of the report this evening is to advise committee of the updates reflected in the council's constitution the council's constitution is a working document which sets out how the council operates how decisions are made and the procedures which are followed to ensure these are efficient transparent and accountable to local people some of these processes are required by law while others are a matter for council to choose the Council's constitution was last reviewed and implemented in December 2020 and under the requirements of Article 16 of the Council's constitution, a review has been undertaken to ensure it is fit for purpose. As part of this review, a number of amendments have been identified. These are highlighted in Appendix 1 and they are tabled as summary in Appendix 2. It should be noted that the constitution has not been subject to a complete constitutional review with only the proposed amendments subject to consideration and therefore a continued review of the constitution should be maintained to ensure its compliance with the council's duties. The changes are centred around job title, for example, if the monitoring officer's details have been updated, we've amended those. Um, enhanced wording, some legislation updates and changes. Uh, policy endorsements reflecting constitutional changes, so if the decisions have been made by council or by the executive, and, and overall the formatting of the document, which will be uh, done again. Um, it is asked this evening for committee to endorse the recommendations to council for the adoption of these changes. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, uh, anybody got any questions on that? Uh, Councillor Pritchard. Thank you. Um, I say the, the, the changes here recommended are essentially items officers have spotted. Um, what plans are there to do members' sessions with the constitution, get all members involved and start feeding into that in advance of the, the next you know, time the council updates the constitution? Um, um, yeah, I um, there was an option, um, there was an opportunity for member input, um, there was a meeting arranged for October and unfortunately we did have some apologies but also no attendance um, and the draft documentation has been circulated to um, some members as well um, but going forward if it's something that the committee would like to consider it, it's something that we can obviously look at um, in terms of maybe having a working group and we can feed into that. 
Yeah, yeah. I think a working group would be a very good idea. I've done m many of those over the last sort of 20 years and you, you, you tend to catch the most interested members. Um, so I think that's something we should, uh, as a committee, ask for is, is formed a, a working group to, to look at the constitution. And um, I know often over the years, the council's always done sort of the reviews ad hoc. I think we should probably also suggest to ourselves as an entity that actually we do this every two or three years um, and actually put that, you know, suggest that's putting the council's forward plans and, and made a bit of a matter of fact process that this authority does. Yeah, yeah I think I think my question was along them lines about if the scrutiny groups had had input into it, uh, looking at their scopes specifically. Um, um, from from a, um, a scrutiny um, perspective, from the terms of reference, I think a more pragmatic approach was taken to grab um, input from um, all um, the groups. Um, looking at the terms of reference, when I did have a look at this, it wouldn't fit within all the scrutiny committee um, because it's a decision that's made at full council. So uh, essentially, when it goes to full council, every uh, um, member will be able to have an opportunity to have, have to say. So, <clears throat> Rob, would, would you prefer a working group of us or from across the council? I mean, I'd suggest the interested members, <laughs> uh, I think, because when I've done them in the past, you end up, you know, it's, it's the members that have got the most interest that tend to come forward. So I would be reluctant for us to define that and actually ask members to self-nominate those that are interested and those that wish to get involved. Would there be time to do that before... It go into full council. We could, you could defer, and I could um, work with demo to see if we can set up a meeting before then. I think the next audit and governance is February, um, so it would go then to full council March time. So subject to endorsement. So we could try and arrange a, a working group prior to then if that works for everybody. How's the committee feel about that? Yep. Uh, so, just to move to hold this over until such time that uh, a working group can be formed and fed in to it. I'll move that. Look for a seconder. That's pretty hard. All those in favour? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, item number nine is the pity stop table. Um, When it, do we know when the next time the Future College Streets Fund is in front of ISAG? Mm, I mean, our next meeting's in February, um, and it is on, on there. Is everyone happy to keep it on that February meeting, or want it move forward, or make a new, an additional meeting? Happy where, where it is. Yeah. Uh, any other queries on on the work plan? Uh, just like to thank everybody for tonight's attendance and all the officers' reports and the work that's gone into them. Uh, and I'd just like to close the meeting at 18.29. Thank you.